Hallelujah. Being in the military myself, I understand what he's about to go through. Amen. My first night there, I had a towel by my bed, and I remember twisting it up, and I was thinking, you dummy, what are you doing here, man? Call my mama names and me names. <laughs> I want to read you something really quick as we're getting started. Uh, we've been talking about favor, God's favor in your life, but this is pretty interesting. I read this in a Charisma article, and it says this. Astonishing 1968 prophecy by a 90-year-old woman, okay? So obviously, she's moved on to heaven since then. But I'm going to read this to you really quick. It's a prophecy update. It says, an old woman of 90 from Valdiers in Norway had a vision from God in 1968. The evangelist, Emmanuel Minos, had meeting services where she lived. He had the opportunity to meet her, and she told him what she had seen. He wrote, he wrote it down, but he thought it would be so unintelligible that he put it in a draw. Now, almost 30 years later, he understands, actually, it's longer than this, he has to share the vision with others. The woman from Valdez was a very alert, reliable, awake, incredible Christian with a good reputation among all who knew her, and this is what she saw. She said, I saw the time just before the coming of Jesus and the outbreak of the Third World War. I saw the events with my natural eyes, and I saw the world like a kind of globe, and I saw Europe land by land. I saw Scandinavia. I saw Norway. I saw certain things that would take place just before the return of Jesus and just before the last calamity happens, a calamity the likes of which I had never before experienced. She mentioned four waves. First, before Jesus comes and before the Third World War breaks out, there will be a Dante, that means peace, like we've never had before. There will be peace between the superpowers in the East and the West, and there will be a long peace. Remember that this was in 1968 when the Cold War was at its highest. In the period of peace, there will be a disarmament in many countries, also in Norway, and we are not prepared when the war comes. The Third World War will begin in a way no one will have anticipated from an unexpected place. Here's number two. A lukewarmness without parallel will take hold of the Christians, a falling away from the true living Christianity. Christians will not be open for penetrating preaching. They will not like in earlier times, want to hear of sin and grace, law and gospel, repentance and restoration, there will come a substitute instead, prosperity, happiness, Christianity. The important thing will be to have success, to be something, to have material things that God never promised us in this way. Churches and prayer houses will be emptier and emptier. Instead of the preaching we will, we've been used to for generations, like to take up your cross and follow Jesus, entertainment, art, and culture will invade the churches where there should have been gatherings for repentance and revival. This will increase markedly just before the return of Jesus. Number three, there will be a moral disintegration that old Norway has never experienced. Now remember, she's from Norway. The likes of people will live together like married without being married. I do not believe the concept of cohabitor, of course it says. Much uncleanness before marriage and much infidelity in marriage will become the natural, the common. We see that now. And it will be justified from every angle. I will even, it will even enter Christian circles and we pet it, every, even sin against nature, homosexuality, just before the return Jesus, uh, of Jesus. There will be TV programs like we have never experienced, and we see that now on our television. It says, TV will be filled with such horrible violence that it teaches people to murder and destroy each other, and it will be unsafe in our streets. People will copy what they see, and they will not, uh, there will not only be one station on TV, it will be filled with stations. Now, she didn't know to use the word channel back then, okay, which we use today. Uh, it says, TV will be just like the radio where we've had many stations. It will be filled with violence. People will use it for entertainment. We will see terrible scenes of murder and destruction, one of the other. And this will spread in society. Sex scenes will also be shown on the screen. Now, right now, we've got Fifty Shades of Grey. That's basically soft porn at the movies right now. And it's just rated R. It should be X. And Christians are going to it, buying advance tickets. We shouldn't see that. David said, I'll place no wicked thing before mine eyes. We have a paragraph that forbids this kind of thing. Uh, it says, it will be, and you will see it all, uh, all we have had before will be broken down and the most indecent things will pass before our eyes. It says people from poor countries will stream to Europe. In 1968, there's no such thing. They will also come to Scandinavia and Norway. There will be many of them that people will begin to dislike them and become hard with them. They will be treated like the Jews before the Second World War. Uh, then the full measure of our sins will have been reached. It says, the tears stream down from the old woman's eyes, down her cheeks. I will not see it, but you will. Then suddenly Jesus will come and the Third World War breaks out. It will be a short war. All that I have seen of war before is only child's play compared to this one, and it will be ended with a nuclear atom bomb. 
The air will be so polluted that no one can draw one's breath, and it will cover several continents, America, Japan, Australia, and the wealthy nations. The water will be ruined, contaminated, and we can no longer till the soil. The result will be that only a remnant will remain. The remnant in the wealthy countries will try to flee to the poor countries, but they will be as hard, as, as hard on us as we were on them. She said, I'm so glad that I will not see it, but when the time draws near, you must take courage and tell this. I have received it from God, and nothing of it goes against what the Bible tells. Wow prophecy update and this is 1968 uh, I, I know I shared on a marriage weekend something pretty interesting is that uh, many years ago I remember a Clint Eastwood movie and this Clint Eastwood movie I didn't remember anything wrong in it and I remember you know we rent the, we used to rent the videotapes now we have everything on all the channels but I rented a videotape and this was some years back and it was a Clint Eastwood videotape and I said I don't remember anything wrong with it and I never rent or go see our movies but I brought this home and I noticed it was R-rated and I went oh my goodness I never read R-rated movies, but I don't remember anything bad in it. And I watched it, and all they had was violence, like fighting, like we call boxing, punching. It wasn't anything really bad. And it was rated R back then. Now, what, what we would call G, or uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's changed so much uh, that that's, what was R then is now like G now or PG now. That's how much we've changed in a, that many years. So, I mean, we've really as a society we've allowed so much and so much compromises come in and it desensitizes us to God and the things of the spirit so I just wanted to tell you she was 1968 having this vision and we're there right now we're there we're seeing all this stuff in the world I never thought some of the stuff I'd see on television that I see right now amen I mean wow so just let you know what time we're at that we need to be right with God serving Jesus Christ amen now, this message I have for you is, uh, as I prayed for the new year, God gave me a word of favor. God's going to favor you in the midst of everything. You put God first, he'll put you first, amen, as we, as we have the favor of God upon our life. Now, I want to show you this. Let me turn this on real quick. God's unmerited favor on our life is not only for your benefit. You know, we talk about favor, most of us think about, oh, look what good thing's going to happen to me. But God will put favor on your life for somebody else. God's blessing on your life for somebody else. So throughout history, God has raised up deliverers for his people. Okay, now here's a scripture. This is in uh, Obadiah 121. It says, And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So in other words, God will favor you. He will anoint you to be a deliverer. You might be a financial deliverer for somebody. You might have that word of wisdom for somebody to bring deliverance in their life. And so, so the favor, if you will, that God puts on you, oftentimes it's for other people. Look at Noah. The Bible says Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord. And God instructed Noah how to build an ark to save many people. Now, only eight people got on the ark, but still they were saved because of the favor on his life. So as God increases favor on your life, again, it's not only for you, but that you could be a deliverer. And throughout the Bible, here's Joseph. Joseph that went through so much trials and trouble. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. God put favor on his life to save many people alive. This is Genesis 50 and 20. He said, but for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So God will bless you with favor so you can be a deliverer for somebody else. You know, the call of Abraham was blessed to be a blessing, and the blessing and favor on your life will bless other people. Genesis 22 and 18, this is what he said, and in your seed Christ shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and by him bless themselves because you have heard and obeyed my voice. So through Abraham and his favor, we're favored today. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. But through his obedience, as God favors you, you're going to bless generations to come. Here's another one. This is Samuel. He was, the, he was the first prophet in Israel and the last judge. And the whole nation was transformed through this man and the word of the Lord that he spoke. And God put favor on his life. It says, now Samuel, the boy Samuel grew and was in favor both with the Lord and with men. So favor that God puts on your life, God's favor will cause you to be favored not only with the Lord and your prayers heard when you cry out to God, but men will favor you. They will bless you. Amen. They will bring blessings. Even, even the smallest thing, you'll be favored. I went to buy vitamins the other day and, and uh, I pulled out my vitamin card. You're supposed to get 50% on your second bottle of vitamins. And, and the guy says, well, no, it's not that time, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to do it for you anyway. That's favor. Even in the little things, we've got to celebrate the little things and give God the glory for the little favors that God does for us. That's just a little thing. But when favor's on your life, he'll cause men, your boss, wherever you go, 
to favor you. I often say my wife's got the anointing for parking places. I don't, I need that anointing, man. We went out to eat last night for Valentine's Day, and we're pulling a packed lot. As soon as you pull up, a car pulls out right in the front. I said, that's the God of Patricia, the anointing for parking places, man. <laughs> Praise God. My kids know it. They say, we're in mom's car. We'll park close. So I need that to rub off on me, baby, that anointing. Now, here's Jesus, the deliverer, the Savior, the Lord God. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So favor to deliver. God blessed him as God, Messiah, with favor for deliverance. It says this in Matthew 121. She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua, which means Savior. For he will save his people from their sins. That is, prevent them from falling and missing the true end and scope of life. So favor in your life. Is for someone else to be delivered. We're going to talk about Esther. Esther was a, a beautiful young lady. Her parents passed away uh, and died, and her uncle Mordecai took her in. Now, if you look at her life, you could see the most unlikely person to go anywhere or do anything. So many things stacked against her. Disaster in her life, treachery and things that happened in her life, intrigue and desperation and disaster. But she became the queen of an empire because of God's favor on her life. And as later we talk about it, through the favor on her life, she saved all of the Jewish people with the favor that God placed upon her. Now here's a scripture, it's Esther 4.14, it says this, And who knoweth whether, whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Whatever your background is, whatever you went through, when you give your life to Jesus Christ and you walk with God, the favor of God in your life will take you places you've never dreamed. And all that came against you, God will use it for good when you put it in his hands. And that's the story of Esther. Now, what's amazing in the story of Esther, God is never mentioned by name, but God is all through this book. So we're going to do some reading, and I'm going to show you this story, and we're going to look at how God put favor on her and how you can increase in God's favor in your life. Now, it was in the days of Ahasuerus Xerxes that Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in Shushan, or Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire, in the palace or castle. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his princes and his courtiers, the chief officers of the Persian and Median uh, army and the nobles and governors of the provinces were there before him while he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor and excellence of his majesty for many days even 180 days so that's like having a feast at your house from now till the end of August that is a long party man they are just feasting and it's all on the king's tab so this is, this is the kind of feast that we're having here okay now his queen was Vashti and it says, also Vasti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. So the, the women were having their thing going on while he was having his thing going on. And it says, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuam, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abakta, and Zether, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains, or eunuchs, that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. He says, man, I want to show you my bride. She's such a beautiful bride. You know, God wants to show off his bride. God wants to show off his people and the beauty that he's placed upon his people. It says, but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. She didn't come. She didn't obey the king's command. The king called, and the king is in front of all of his people, and his wife is telling him, no, I'm not coming. The bride's saying no. And by the chamberlains, therefore the king was wroth, and his anger burned in him. So the chamberlains, or the eunuchs, called her, but she wouldn't go. And I'm going to show you later on, these chamber chamberlains, or these eunuchs, are a type of the Holy Spirit and the call of God. She said no. Now, here's a picture of the king's bride, or the bride of Christ, saying no to the king's command. The seven eunuchs, again, are a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, God wants a yielded bride. God wants a people that say yes to him, that says, yes, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do, I'll be, I'll become. And this is a picture of Rebecca. Now, Rebecca didn't know her husband, Isaac, when the servant of Abraham went to her, and it's, she said this when the brother and his, her brethren asked, will you go and be the wife of Isaac? It said they called Rebecca and said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? And look what she said, I will go. This isn't a shotgun wedding, amen. You say yes to God. She said yes, and the rest is history in her life. God's favor on your life is going to begin the moment you say yes to him. And I wonder about Vashti. Was she a Jewish woman? Maybe she was. But she told the king no. And we'll never know. She falls off of the pages of scripture, and we never hear from her again. Now, maybe she just, she, you know, she lived out the rest of her life. We don't know. 
But if she was Jewish, we don't know. But deliverance did not come through Vashti. She told God, no. So God's favor on your life is going to begin the moment you say yes to him, saying yes to God. Here's Mary. And it says in Luke 1, 28, And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that are highly favored. Whenever God sends a word to your life, whenever God sends someone to you that's from him, favor is coming to you. God is wanting to pour out favor. Whenever God asks you to do something in the kingdom, when you're asked to minister, when you're asked to, you're asked to sweep the carpet, you're asked to teach the kids, favor is coming to you when you're saying yes to the Lord. Amen? God's going to pour out grace, and he never takes it back. Once he gives you his grace and that anointing, it's yours, it's upon you, and you'll increase in God's God's favor on your life and the angel came unto her and said hail thou that are highly favored I'm going to say this every Christian in here you've received Christ you are highly favored of God God's presence has come to you God's word has come to you it said blessed art thou amongst women and Mary said at the end of what the angel Gabriel said to her and this is verse 38 behold the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word or yes Lord I submit to you God let it be just like you said she could have said no what if Mary would have told the angel Gabriel that said you're highly favored God wants to birth the Messiah to deliver the whole world through you you see the favor on her life brought salvation to the whole world through Christ she birthed Christ. But what if she said no? What if she said, the price is too high for me to pay. I, I can't go through the ridicule of men. And she said no. What would have happened? God would have chose somebody else. And we'd be talking about them. If she would have said no. But she said yes. And currents of favor came upon her life. And she's blessed of God. We're still talking about her today. We'll be talking about her for time and eternity. Reminds me of a story uh, Within, within Catholic circles, I know they have Mariology where they pray to Mary. And the Bible says not to do that. But I remember one guy was really talking negative uh, about Mary. And the Lord spoke to him and said, that's my mom you're talking about. <laughs> She's blessed amongst women and we honor her. Amen. We don't pray to her, but we honor her. Hallelujah. Because Mary said yes to God, salvation again came to the whole world. So when God comes to you and you say yes to salvation, if you will, you say yes, salvation will come through you. To somebody man you know when I got saved glory to God I said yes Lord and that's when favor came on my life blessing came on my life and God's salvation began to flow through me to other people people started getting saved and blessed when you say yes to God his anointing will begin to move through your life it's not your ability it's your availability a yielded heart that says yes Lord I'll do whatever you want I'll go wherever you want me to go one guy didn't want to say yes to God because he was afraid God was going to send him to China. So he kept running from God for so long. And finally God spoke to him and said, I don't even want you to go to China. He was so afraid of the will of God. Don't be afraid of God's will. He's got a robe and a mantle of favor made for you. You don't have to be jealous about anybody else. God's got something especially made just for you. And it's his favor upon your life. He has a plan for you. And God is excited about the destiny and the plan he has for your life. He wants you to put on his shoes of blessing. He wants you to walk in his way so you can enter into the destiny that he has for you. And the favor that comes on your life. You know, scripture says all things that work together for good. And we just usually stop quoting there. It says the called. And the word called of the invited according to his purpose God has a purpose for your life and if you're going to stand in God's purpose for your life favor will be there for every step of the way and you're going to need favor to open doors for you you're going to need favor for the miraculous when you say yes to God and his purpose for your life he's going to go before you and make a way if he says I want you to go out into the desert dig a hole a shovel will be, will be waiting for you there or somebody's coming with a shovel his favor will make a way when you say yes to the purpose of God for your life and it's a progressive purpose he's not showing you everything so he shows you one thing okay this is what I want you to do I want you to be a doorman in the house of God and you say yes Lord I'll do it and you're excited about it and it's, it seems like it's such a simple thing but God said everything that you do for me is an honorable thing everything you do for me even the small things is an honorable thing the king of kings and the Lord of glory asked you to be a doorman glory to God you've been exalted you've been exalted the king of kings and the Lord of glory wants you to sweep the carpet you've been exalted well, wait a minute, is that an exalted position? You're doing it for him. Your reward's with him. If you bring a cup of cold water to somebody in the name of the Lord, man, you, you're being blessed by God. You're, you're doing it for him. It's a place of exaltation. Now, here's Esther. She could have said no to God and missed her God-given destiny to save her people, but she didn't. Esther 4.14 says this. This is what Mordecai said to her. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance shall arise for the Jews from elsewhere. God's people is going to get delivered if you say no. That's what he's telling her. You say no, God's going to get the job done. 
but you and your father's house will perish. And all who knows, and, and who knows, but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, for this occasion. So God blesses you with the business. God blesses you with favor. God gives you wisdom and blesses you with so many things. And then there's a time where you can be a blessing of deliverance and you tell him no. Man, say yes to God because, listen, you can't outgive him. Whatever you give, listen, it'll come back on every wave and every measure in your life. She said, yes, Lord. Now, this was the first national beauty pageant, okay? This was the beauty pageant. So what happened was Vastai said no. So the next thing that happens is princes say, man, we can't have this. Now, guys, you're like this back then. They said, we can't have our woman telling us no, man. We got to do something. So what they did is they said, I'll tell you what, king. We're going to have a national beauty pageant. So he's thinking about it. Okay, we're going to read this. It says, then the king's servants who ministered to him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. So he's probably liking this right now. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the capital in Sushan, to the harem under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who's in the charge of the women. And let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So he put Vashti out now. She's out in the cold, so to speak, maybe concubine, whatever. We don't really know, but she's not queen anymore. So he's really liking this. This thing pleased the king. So basically, the beauty pageant, the winner is his bride, and all the other women are his concubines. He definitely, a natural man would be happy with that. We understand that. I can only handle one, so I don't know how they did that. Love you, baby. <laughs> so Esther was taken to the king's harem. So there was a certain Jew in the capital of Sushan whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And he had brought up Hadassah, that's her real Jewish name, Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The maiden was beautiful and lovely, so she was like a Cinderella, if you will. You know, she went through such hard times. I'm here to tell you, there is no fairy godmother coming with a magic wand, but there is a God who will deliver you, who will see your tears and hear your cries, and he will come to you in the midnight hour. You know, weeping may endure for the night, but there's joy in the morning, Amen. It may not happen when you think it should happen, but you keep serving God and you watch what God's going to do for you. Amen? He keeps all your tears in a bottle. And so when the king's command and his decree was proclaimed, and many maidens were gathered in Sushan, the capital, under the custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's house under the custody of Haggai. Now, what if she went and said, I don't want to be here. I don't want to I don't want to be no harem. She could have had an attitude. You know, attitude determines altitude. Sometimes we get an attitude in God's purposes in our life. God begins to move in our life, and it's not what we anticipated or expected. Circumstances are out of our control, and in much of our life, many things will be out of our control, but it's not out of his control. Jesus said to Pilate, you could have no power over me except it was given for, to you from above. You've got to believe if you're a child of God, there's nothing coming into your life that God, if God is allowing it, you've got to trust him. You've got to trust him when you don't know why. And keep your attitude positive that this thing's going to work out. I don't understand how it's going to work out, but it's going to work out. Do you know, many jobs that I had in times past, every time I started a new job, I never really liked it at first. Some people might have, but I was getting used to things and used to people. But you know what? After a while, man, God worked it out, and I started really liking it. And this would happen over and over again as, as different events would happen in my life. We just got to keep a good attitude because that determines the altitude that you're going to rise up in the things of life. Now, it says here, Esther was taken to the king's house unto the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. Now, this is really interesting. Haggai, God bless you, means meditation word, groaning and separation. This is what his name means. So she's put under the authority of a eunuch who has a name that means meditation word, groaning and separation. I'm going to show you this. So Esther's submission to Haggai brought God's unmerited favor upon her life. Haggai is a type of the word of God. When you submit to God's word, favor is going to increase on your life. When you obey God's word, favor is coming to you. When you keep his commands, favor is on your life. Amen. He's looking over. He's watching over those who keep his word. You're walking in obedience. Favor is coming on your life. And she submitted to Haggai, who is a type of the word of God. It said, an amazing pleased Haggai, which again means the word, and obtained his favor. Are you living a life according to God's word? You're pleasing to God when you keep his commandments and you do the things that he said in his word and you begin to increase in favor. And he speedily gave her the things for her purification. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Favor brings acceleration on your life. 
Maybe you've been waiting for something, but as you're obeying God and you're walking in his favor, acceleration will come upon your life. And everything that you want and everything you're believing, he'll bring acceleration. I believe when we started this ministry, acceleration was on this ministry. We came from below zero. Her cake Katrina wiped everything out. We had nothing, and God said, go into ministry. And in a very short time, we had the buildings and everything. When favor's on your life, God brings acceleration. I remember when we bought these buildings, the guys in this, that own this outlet mall weren't selling to anybody. But when I walked in, he said to me, you've got good karma. <laughs> so he said, you've got good karma. <laughs> it's favor. And God opened the door. God opened the door. When we bought floors and we would buy things and do things, I would cry out to God, God, I need this. God, I need that. I needed carpet and somebody showed up and we got carpet at half price. I needed chairs and I needed $5,000 to buy chairs. $5,000 to buy chairs. And we only had like 15 people in the church that was in my living room at the time. And I'm like, God, I need $5,000 for chairs. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the money. Somebody gave an offer and we bought the chairs that day. I didn't tell anybody. It just came in. Glory to God. Isn't God good? Amen favor on your life so you're going to need favor he's going to bring you to an impossible situation that you can't figure out you can't do and you're going to have to trust God and his favor and his anointing on your life to make a way where there wasn't a way I know a way maker who will raise every valley and lower every mountain he'll make a way when the mortgage company says I'm coming to get your house you can say no you're not I walked all over this house it's mine devil and you're not getting it glory to God God's favor on your life so what, what happens Pastor Joe if I lose everything it'll come back favor Lost everything, Katrina, it all came back. Praise God. Favor on your life. So she obtained favor, and he speedily gave her all the things for her purification and her portion of food and the seven chosen maids to be given her from the king's palace. And he removed her and her maids to the best apartment in the harem. So here's the next thing. The name means separation. How many know when you submit to the word of God, there's going to be a separation? The people you used to run with, you can't run with anymore. You can't hang with some people anymore because that influence on your life is going to influence you. The word brought a separation and put her in the best place. When you put God first, he'll put you first. Amen? That's exactly what happened with Esther. She began increasing in currents of favor. It, it started as a seed. It started as a small thing, but it begins growing and growing because she keeps saying yes she's got the great attitude she submitted to the word of God so she came under the influence are you under the influence I got to ask you today are you under the influence people are driving and, they, and you know they're swerving all over the road and they say we got to pull that person over he's under the influence but can your neighbors tell you're under the influence of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit do you have the influence of joy the influence of peace the influence of mercy and goodness on your life the influence of his prosperity and his great grace upon your life you need to drive under the influence go to work under the influence pay your bills under the influence raise your family under the influence of the anointing of the word of God upon your life glory to God and favor will increase in your family and your house and everything that you have I've been under the influence now for 30 years praise God oh hallelujah I'm not just tipsy you see some people something we talked about natural alcohol sipping saints man you got to get your big gulp of the word of God and the Holy Ghost upon your life man if you're going to have joy do this thing right amen get under the influence so when we obey and conform our lives to God's word, we're going to walk in favor. You're going to walk in God's favor. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, how about that? Really loves me. Not just says, I love you, Lord. We sing songs, I love you, Lord. Okay. If you really love him, he will keep my word and obey my teaching. That's what he said. And my father will love him. And look at this. We will come to him and make our home abode, our special dwelling place with him. How about that? So what's going to happen when the king of glory comes in your house? You ever had somebody very wealthy and well-to-do come to your house and maybe look around and say, hey, I just want to bless you. I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, God is a giver. He doesn't have cirrhosis of the giver. He's a giver. Amen? He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. So when the king comes to make his abode in your house, guess what's going to happen? He's going to bless your house. He's going to bless everything in that house. When you keep his commandments, you increase in favor. His presence brings favor, and I'm going to show you that later. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teaching. And my teaching, which you hear and heed, is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. Here's the next thing. His name means meditation. That means thinking about God's word. So here it, it indicates, if you will, favor is going to increase on your life as you meditate on the word of God. And you begin thinking about God's word. You chew it over and over in your mind. Scripture says, now watch this. And we're talking about favor. Now watch this. Who wants to be a success? Everybody? Anybody want to fail? No, I don't want to fail. My, both my hands are down. 
The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's what he said. But you shall meditate on it day and night. That means think about it. It means chew the cud, swallow it, and spit it up again, and think about God's commands. And look what it says. And it you, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Now watch this. I want you to notice this next part of the verse. Does it say God's going to make your way prosperous or you? Now watch this. For then you, for, for then you shall make your way what? Prosperous then you shall deal wisely and have good success. So God's saying, if you want to walk in my prosperity, you've got to meditate on my word. You'll have great success if you meditate on the word. Yeah, God is the force that moves in your life, but you have a part to play for your miracle. If you look in the Gospels, every miracle that took place, people had a part to play in it. One man was blind, and he cried out. It was blind Bartimaeus, and a disciple said, shut up, you old fool, but he kept crying out. And Jesus healed the man's eyes. Another two blind men came to Jesus, and Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Now think about this. They're blind. What if he would have said, we need a new chariot? We need a new chariot. They don't got a new chariot, whatever it is. He said, what do you want me to do? So then he says, what do you want me to do? He says, we're blind, Lord. And then, and then the next thing he says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? He didn't say, okay, let me pray for you. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And he said, yes, Lord, and they received their sight. They had a part to play as they were moving towards him. As, you, as you're moving towards God, currents of favor are moving towards you. He said, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. Are you drawing nigh? Or you just get some blessing from God and walk away? Listen, I'm, I'm here to tell you, you stick with him like glue. Man, he is the blessing. Knowing him, stuff and things come and go, but God is the blessing. When you know him, favor comes on your life, amen? Blessing on your life. Knowing him is the blessing. Here's the next scripture. We're all familiar with this in Psalm 1. It's, it, in Psalm 1, we'll look at verse 2. It says, The man who's blessed, his delight and desire in the law of the Lord. And on his law, the precepts and instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and night. If you're a man, you're a woman who does this. And remember, God's an equal opportunity employer. Amen. It doesn't matter. Man or woman, you'll do this. Favor's coming on your life in every aspect. And he will be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. That's favor on your life. And that's to the degree that we obey and conform our lives to God's word It's going to determine the degree of favor that we walk in. If you look in the kings of the Old Testament, it would say this king served God, but he kept the high places. In other words, there were areas of disobedience still in his life that he didn't want to deal with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with you this much, God, but there's some areas of my life, you know, I don't, I don't want you to go there. Listen, you've got to sell out to God. You've got to go all the way with God. You want to walk in the fullness of his blessing? You want to walk in the fullness of his favor and anointing on your life? There's some things that God will require of you. There's some things that other people do that you're not going to be able to do if you want to walk in his favor and his anointing and his power and his blessing on your life. How much favor do you want to walk in? How much anointing do you want to walk in? It costs Jesus everything, but there's some things you're not going to be able to do. I'm talking about other activities. You may see another Christian doing it, but maybe that person's not been set, up, set apart for, for use unto God. You know, there's on, vessels of honor, and then there's vessels for common use. Every woman knows that. The fine china you put on display, right, and you bring out all the dishes. My wife, sometimes we have the paper plates. Let's pass around the paper plates, right? Throw them right away. But when you have the dignitaries coming over, what do you pull out? The fine china. What do you want to be, fine china or paper plates? I want to be a vessel of honor. And here's Esther separated, separated from all the other maidens because of God's favor. Genesis 18, 19, this was of Abraham. And this is what God said. For I have known, chosen, acknowledged him as my own, uh, so that he may teach and command his children and the sons of his house after him to keep the way of the Lord and to do what is just and righteous so that the Lord, look at this, this is causative of Abraham. This is favor, in this in instance, is causative of Abraham to keep the way of the Lord. Now watch this, so that. So because Abraham is doing this, God says, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm telling you, you don't want to pay, pay the high cost of disobedience. When you walk in God, favor is going to come on your family. Favor will come on your children's children and blessing to a thousand generations. He says, so that the Lord may bring Abraham, what he has promised him. Wow. If you want to walk in favor, you might come to the altar. Someone will give you a word. The Lord says you're going to do this and God's going to do this. But you have a part to play in that. It's called obedience. It's called faithfulness and obedience to God. You have a part to play in those things coming to pass. Now, again, Haggai's name means meditation, word, groaning, separation. And watch this. I want to show you the scripture. Now, this is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. So why do we try so hard to fit in when God has set you apart? Favor, many times, it'll set you apart, if you will. 
And some people may ostracize you. I know my daughter coming up many times, someone, you know, would ostracize her because she just would come out and tell people, you're in sin, you're going to hell. She didn't have any tact as a child, right? But when you're separated unto God, amen, when you live in a life sanctified, people will ostracize you. In the military, the guys would ostracize me all the time, didn't want to hang around me, didn't want to be about me because I wasn't going to curse like them, I wasn't going to talk like them, I wasn't a good old beer drinking buddy like them. I said, guys, we're not going to do that. I'm living holy for God, and it offended them. But always, always, always when they needed somebody to pray for them, they always came to me, always. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. So come out from among them, unbelievers, and separate, sever yourselves from them. There's some relationships you got to watch out for. Says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing. Whatever makes you unclean is a thing you couldn't touch. Whatever defiles your conscience and keeps you from God is what you need to stay from. And he says this, touch not any unclean thing, and I will receive you and kindly with, uh, receive you kindly and treat you with what? Favor. You want to walk in favor, again, you've got to come out from amongst them. You know, we're having this picnic for Mardi Gras. I don't celebrate Mardi Gras. I came out from that. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to be part of that reveling anymore. I know as Joey Hall said, so what if it rains? God spoke to me years ago, and some of you have heard me say this. I was praying about Mardi Gras one year, and I said, oh, God, let torrents of cold, icy rain come down on their naked bodies as they're reveling in the streets. And I was going on and this and on and on and on. And then the Lord told me, because we had a church picnic, he said, what about the picnic? I said, I never thought about the picnic, God. He said, son, I rain on the just and the unjust. He said, don't use your faith to change the weather. All they're going to do is go inside and sin because sin is in their heart. He said, use your faith to change people. When their hearts change, they'll live for me whether it's rainy or sunshine. Right? That's what God said. Sometimes we get things kind of mixed up, but he corrected me pretty quick on that one. Look what he says. I'll treat you with favor, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Let's go back to this text here again and look at Esther. So now when the turn of each maiden came to go into the king, Ahasuerus, after the regulations for the women had been carried out for 12 months, 12 months, since this was the regular period for their beauty treatments, ladies, how would you like this? 12 months at the spa every day, cream on your face, cucumbers on your eyes, doing your nails. Oh, oh, I'm looking good, girl. Are they doing your toenails? They're rubbing you down. Put some more of that salt stuff on me. And, you know, doing your hair, doing your eyelashes every day, soaking in the tub. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you can, you, some of y'all say, yeah, I hear you, man. 12 months of that, yeah. Sign me up. Well, here's the problem in this case. If you didn't win this beauty pageant, you would end up as the concubine. Maybe never to see the king again one time. This is what they were facing, okay? So 12 months of beauty treatment, six months with the oil of myrrh, and six months with sweet spices and perfumes and with the things for the purifying of women. Then in this way the maiden came to the king. Whatever she desired was given her to take with her from the harem into the king's palace. So look, you're going to have to please the king, so you can take whatever you want. If you want to take your little fan and take it in, you know, you want to take a scarf in, whatever you can take, whatever you want into the king to see if you can please the king. I'm going to show you something very important about this. In the evening she went, and the next day she returned into the second harem in the custody of Shagahaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She came to the king no more unless the king delighted in her, and she was called for by name. In other words, if she wasn't rememberable, if she wasn't somebody that pleased the king, she didn't come before him anymore. I want to show you a picture of this. They soaked in myrrh, and they soaked in all these things for 12 months. It's a picture of the anointing of God. You need to spend time in God's presence if you want to be a person of favor. God's anointing. You sit in God's anointing, and you soak it in. You can soak in His presence. The more you stay in God's presence, you marinate in His presence, and favor will be on your life. Everywhere you go, there'll be an anointing with everyone you meet. I want to show you this. This is Esther 2.12. What I just read to you, the six months of sweet spices and perfumes speaks of the anointing. And I'm going to show you uh, here how the anointing brings favor. In the Old Testament, David had the Ark of the Covenant. And what happened was he wanted to bring it up to Jerusalem to worship God because David was a worshiper. And so he put it on a cart which was not the way he was supposed to carry it. And the the Bible says that a man named Uzzah reached out and touched the ark and was struck dead immediately because they broke God's protocol of his presence. So David got afraid. And this is a good thing to fear the Lord. And he got afraid and he put the 
ark in the house of Obed-Edom. He said, man, look, this thing's deadly. I'm putting this thing away. I'm getting it into the house of Obed-Edom. And watch what happened to Obed-Edom. It says, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. I mean, if his daughters were ugly, they start looking good. You know, when you got the anointing on your life, you've got favor on your life, you can paint it, pull it, and tuck it, but the favor on your life makes you beautiful, amen? In God's presence, he makes you glorious and beautiful. And it was told King David, I like this, are people talking about you? What, why are they so blessed? Why are they so happy? Why is all these good things happening to them? What is going on with them? When you're walking in God's presence, when you make your home a place of God's presence, and you're not allowing profane things in, and you're keeping the presence of God in your house, favor, currents of favor is moving through your house, and people will notice that you're the blessed of the Lord. They should be talking about you. You shouldn't be out there just looking at all the heathen and saying, why are they so blessed? That's not, that's nothing. We got the blesser, amen, of all blessings. Don't look at the material stuff. As you walk in, in the presence of God, God will bless you with everything you need and more. If God doesn't give it, you don't want it anyway. So the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with rejoicing. His presence brought favor on his house. Now I want to show you really quick in the, the Bible, there's five elements of God's anointing. And each one of these elements speaks of a virtue of Christ that we'll have in our life. If we want to increase in favor, we need this to work in our life. We need God's word working in us, working these character traits in us so we can increase in God's favor. She soaked for 12 months, meaning it wasn't a one-night process. As you want to grow in God's favor, you've got to continue to walk in God. You've got to keep coming to the house of God. Come to the Bible classes. Man, every time the doors are open, come in and say, I want to receive from God and spend time in prayer. Spend time in his word and favor is going to keep rising high in your life like a current, like a current going higher and higher in him. Now watch this scripture, Exodus 30 and 23 and 25. This is what God told Moses when they were to make the anointing oil. He said, take also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon half so much, even 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus 250 shekels, and of cassia 500 shekels, and of the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil. So five things that I have highlighted there, and a hen, and thou shalt make it unto an oil of holy ointment and the ointment compound after the art of apothecary or making perfumes it shall be a holy anointing oil so the first thing she soaked in and the first element of God's anointing is myrrh myrrh is a resin or a gum that oozes from a tiny shrub is very bitter to the taste and it produces a beautiful fragrance. It speaks of a life of true discipleship, of dying the self. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Dying the self is never a pleasurable thing. It's often difficult as we're putting ourselves down, putting that flesh down and dying to self. This is the first thing. If you want favor, you have to be a person that lives for God. Put in yourself, if you will. Put, it, put in that flesh down. Paul said it this way. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've never counseled or, or witnessed or shared with anyone who's come to me and said, you know, uh, he said, Pastor Joe, uh, I'm struggling with, with lust. If that person was a dead man, a dead man's never complained about lust. He's dead. He's dead, right? When a person dies to sell, those things, you're dead to it. You're dead to it. When you're dead to that sin, it won't have that pull on you anymore. We've got to soak in the oil of myrrh to have his favor on our life. Now, the Bible says she bathed in sweet spices. spices. The next ingredient of God's holy anointing oil is cinnamon. I'm going to show you what this means. Sweet cinnamon comes from the bark of a tree and has a certain fragrant sweetness. The, the root meaning of the word cinnamon is to be straight or stand upright. The quality of walking upright, being straight before the Lord. Being straight before the Lord brings favor on your life. Cinnamon represents integrity and walking in truth. Integrity. The second thing, dying to self, walking in integrity. Remember, she's soaking in these spices for 12 months. And they're a picture of character traits in us. Psalms 18.23 says, I was upright before him and blameless with him, ever on guard to keep myself free from sin and guilt. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who's crooked in his ways. Integrity righteousness upright before him here's the next part of that anointing oil sweet calamus only got a couple minutes I'll finish this so this was a tall reed like grass with hollow stems and the Hebrew word for the plant means reed of fragrance 
It's indeed a very sweet smelling plant. It also speaks of sweet cane or sugar cane. The ingredient speaks of our fellowship with the Lord, a sweetness of walking with God. So walking in uprightness and fellowshipping with God, you'll increase in God's favor on your life as you're spending time with Him. What's on Him gets on you. What's on Him gets on you. You, you become like who you fellowship with. Hang out with somebody who's smoking in the car with you. What are you going to smell like? Smoke. You're going to soak it in. Hang out with God. Guess what? What's on him gets on you. What's on him gets on you. I know of what I speak. Amen. Oh, his joy will be your joy. Amen. Glory to God. My favorite thing is fellowshipping with God. This is Song of Solomon 2.14. Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. That speaks of the fellowship of God. Man, as you're fellowshipping with him, oh, my goodness, his blessing and favor is upon your life. You increase in favor. Here's the next one, cassia. It's a beautiful flower with a little purple part of the flower in it. It's like cinnamon. It's found in a bark of a shrub, and it grows in a high altitude and possesses a little purple flower. The root means bowing down or shriveled, stoop. It means humility. You know, when you, it grows in a high altitude. So what is that picture? When you spend time with God, I don't know anybody who's ever truly come into God's presence and boasted proudfully. You know, if you look in the Bible, Job said, now I saw you, and I'm a, I'm a worm. I'm nothing. When he saw God, he complained against God. Until he saw God, he said, whoa, wow. When you get along with God and you come into his presence, you realize what you're not. I am nothing, God. David said, I'm a dead dog and a flea. John fell at his feet as a dead man in the book of Revelation. It brings humility when you see God. You have a revelation of God. Humility has worked in your life. That comes from fellowshipping with God. He is God, amen. And he's so awesome and mighty and powerful, upholding all the universe in his hands. When you come into his presence, pride leaves the room. It says, the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek and humble with salvation. These are five elements. If you want to increase in favor, you've got to have this on your life. Now, here's the next ingredient, olive oil. It binds it all together. It speaks of the Holy Spirit who's working the character of Christ in us, okay, which is a process. Philippians 2.13, it says, Not on your own strength, for it is God who is all the while affects you at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work His good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. So it's God, the Holy Spirit, working all these things in you. But remember, she was obedient to Haggai, which speaks of the Word. Now, this is where I'm going to close on this one. I'll pick up on this next week. So Esther is a picture of being under the authority of God's Word, increasing in favor, and being filled with His Spirit, the result was favor with the king. Let me show you this. Job 29 and 6. When I washed my steps with butter, the rock poured me out rivers of oil. Anybody want to know how you make butter? Anybody got a clue? What do you do? You churn milk, right? You churn milk and you make butter. So if you will, butter is the wealth of milk. And milk speaks of the word of God. The Bible says as babies desire the sincere milk of the word. So as you're studying God's word, you're working God's word, you begin to walk in the wealth of God's word. That's butter. So when you walk in the wealth of God's word, look what it says. The rock pours you out rivers of oil and anointing, and you begin to get an anointing of favor on your life because you're walking in the wealth of the word of God. Favor increases on in your life. Esther's a picture of this. Amen? Oh, glory. Y'all quiet. I hope y'all getting this. Amen? Glory to God. I want you to get this. Now, yeah, I got 60 seconds. I'll do this. I want you to see this. This is so important. The Holy Spirit spoke this to me many years ago on this particular scripture. Now, when the turn for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, had come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's attendant, the keeper of the women, suggested. What do you suggest? You know him. What is he like? What is he like? And Esther won favor in the sight of all who saw her. She didn't take what she thought, but she said, what is the king like? What's his heart? I want to know his heart. Well, here's the picture. She totally trusted the leading of the chief eunuch. This chief eunuch also is a picture of the Holy Spirit. He knows the heart of God. God, make me pleasing. Holy Spirit, make me pleasing to the Father. Make me pleasing to the Father so I can live a pleasing life. If you want to walk in favor, you're going to have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. She took nothing into the king but what he, what he said. For what person perceives and knows and understands what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit within him. Just so no one discerns and comes to know and comprehend the thoughts of God except 
the Spirit of God. He's a type of the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit. And we know what happened. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the 10th month, the 10th month of Tebereth, in the 7th year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the women. Now you've got to imagine, how many women was she competing against? 1,000? 500? We're talking beautiful women, and she beat them all. How? Favor. I told you it's not just cover girl, it's favor. It's favor. You can paint it, bullet, and tuck it, but it's favor. Amen. And then look what it says. The king loved her more than all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in the sight more than all the maidens, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, I'm not going to be able to go on there, but later on, when Haman tried to wipe out the nation, it was favor that she went into the king's palace. And the way the king was, he had a royal scepter. And you had to come into the, his presence. And if he didn't put out his scepter to you, it meant death. You come into his presence without the scepter coming out, it meant death. But every time she walked in his presence, the scepter came out, which means favor. And it was favor she was able to come before the king and make her request. And she saved her people because of favor. Somebody may be relying on you to walk in God's favor, to walk in his anointing and power. And God's favor in your life is going to bring deliverance, maybe even to your own family, because of his favor. I know my kids are alive today because of God's favor on my life. It's another story for another time. But amen, why don't you stand up with me today, amen, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. Father, we bless you, Father, we praise you, hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we've worshipped you today. Father, we thank you for being in your house. God, I pray for your people today. Favor upon your people. Favor upon your people. Just lift your hands with me. I want to decree a blessing of favor upon your life. Father God, I pray that your people will begin to walk in great occurrence of your favor and mercy, Lord God. Even as Esther became a great deliverer because of favor, Lord God, I pray your favor upon your people, Lord God. Father, let them come under the influence of the word and the spirit, Lord God, that they may walk and currents of favor upon their life. I decree, Lord God, upon them, favor, healing, blessing, and grace, Lord God. Give them a circumcised heart to walk with you, Lord God, all the days of their life. Father, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Father, we decree this on your people, and we give you praise and glory in the house of God. It'll help you, but God bless you. I release you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.